uh, I'm delighted to be here, and I want to thank uh, Peter for inviting me today. I hope I have the opportunity over the two days to get a chance to meet each of you and say hello. Um, I was asked to uh, write about transfer price manipulation uh, in the context of developing countries, and when Peter and I talked about this, I said, Peter, this is a subject that's near and dear to my heart. It's actually how I got into this area. Uh, my PhD supervisor was Carl Schaup. Uh, some of you may remember that at the end of the Second World War, he went into Japan and set up the tax system. He led a variety of tax missions to developing countries. He was on the uh, committee in 1977 that wrote the report on transfer price manipulation in developing countries. So from the get-go, my own supervisor coming into my dissertation, which was done on transfer pricing, was a focus on uh, not just looking at the straight economics of this, but also the, the impacts on other countries. Having said that, um, I am trained as an economist and do tend to think of these things in economic terms, and I'm now in a business school, which makes me even more on the, uh, the far side uh, of, these, of these views, and uh, so I am, I'm going to come at that from that way. Having said this, I, I am very much aware uh, that what was a subject that almost nobody talked about when I was doing my dissertation and then through the 1980s has now become an extraordinarily hot potato. And uh, part of the question is why? Um, some of this, I think, is the um, machinations that companies like Enron were involved in, uh, something like setting up uh, 4,000 subsidiaries in a little Caribbean island in one year. I mean, letterbox companies. Uh, so part of this is the how should I say it, the mixing up of transfer pricing with other issues and the perception that, therefore, somehow all transfer pricing is bad. Um, I don't have much time. I realize we're going, so I will go fairly quickly for this. I'd, I'd ask if you have the opportunity to read the paper, and I'd appreciate any comments. I've structured this more generally as talking about the some of this you know, the arm's length standard. Why do firms engage in transfer price manipulation? How do they set transfer prices? A little bit on the ethical issues, and then ending what I'm calling now uh, abusive transfer price uh, transfer pricing. Maybe I should say parenthetically, I've also just come from a workshop on fraud in organizations at Queen's University in Kingston, uh, which brought a group of researchers together, primarily uh, accountants and org behavior professionals, to start to do better work on fraud in organizations. So it seems to me to have a clear link with. Uh, uh, with this issue. Let me start by saying I distinguish between obviously the transfer price and the setting of the price, which is transfer pricing, manipulation of the price too high or too low because of some kind of exogenous activity, and then I am going to talk to you later about what I think of as abusive transfer pricing. It is very clear to me that there are many uh, stakeholders involved in this now, not just multinationals and national tax authorities. Uh, we have representatives of the OECD here. I don't know if anybody's here from the WTO. Uh, there is a huge tax planning industry dominated by the big four, and there are a variety now of what I would say new stakeholders, the NGOs, Tax Justice Network, the Christian Aid, that historically did not pay attention to this. I think the climate's gotten significantly work, worse. There are many more multinationals than there ever used to be. There are many more governments now, over 50 governments, reg with transfer pricing regulations on the books. There are greater concern over illicit flows. Uh, all of the uh, work the OECD has been doing on abusive tax havens feeds into this. Uh, as I said, the collapse of Enron, now last year the global financial crisis and many firms going into receivership and disappearing. This is just a much tougher climate uh, for this issue than it, uh, than it used to be. Going all the way back to the foundations of when I wrote my dissertation on this uh, many years ago, uh, I learned the multinational was a multi-plant, multi-market monopoly, and the whole idea behind it is it was maximizing global profits after tax. <laughs> If there were external prices for comparable products, those are the prices the firm would choose. And that Jack Hirschleifer proved that in the 1950s. That's not new. It's actually the foundation that underlies the arm's length standard, that firms, if there are open market prices, uh, would be efficient for those to use the prices. Problems? There may not be one. 
there are no open market transactions. Even if there are, there have to be adjustments. And even if there were and you didn't need adjustments, multinationals in and of themselves create interdependencies of demand and supply. They're networks. They have economies of scale and scope. Those things need to be taken account of in the price and are not taken account of just by going to outside prices. This is a picture I'm sure many of you have seen. Internal comparables, you look to see whether the firm is both buying on the inside and buying on the outside, or it's selling on the inside, selling on the outside. Or maybe, if you're lucky, maybe you can find two unrelated firms engaged in the same transactions at the same time and use that price to back into the transfer price. This is a focus on the transaction and on comparable transactions in order to determine the arm's length standard. And what I mean here is that you have to have comparability at a whole sling of levels. And the way to think of these, I think, is from the narrowest, tightest up. You have to have uh, attributes of the product, attributes of the transaction, attributes of the functions performed by each of the two parties, attributes of the firm, and attributes of the market all taken into account to actually determine whether or not you're meeting the arms like test. And that's a, that's a heavy list. To, if you really want to use the arm's length standard appropriately. We know there are a variety of methods. The, typically, we focus on product-based methods. That would be the cup and the cut that most of you are aware of. Function-based methods, typically resale price and gross uh, and cost plus. And then the profit methods, um, CPM, TNMM, and uh, then profit split methods. Notice that each of these requires different kinds of comparability depending upon whether it's a focus on the transaction, you're using cup, or it's a focus on functions, you're using cost plus or, or uh, resale price, or it's a focus on, prod on, pr on profits where you're using, say, TNMM or profit splits. For example, here's product-based methods. You are looking for internal comparables at the level of the transaction and, uh, and of the product. Here's a function-based or a profit-based, in other words, net or gross profit-based, where really what you have is an exporter and you assume instead of I import, I imported from an arm's length manufacturing firm that could have I could have contracted it out for. I look to see uh, what margin they would have charged me to perform that service for me. I use that margin to then back into the, into the transfer price. Or flip it and go the other way. The tested party is the importer and I say I want to sell into that country. I don't want to have a wholly owned subsidiary to do it. What I do is I contract it out to a contract distributor. What would I have to pay that distributor to carry it for me? What would Walmart charge me to put it on the shelves, in other words? And I do that either in terms of a gross margin or I do it in terms of a net margin. The comparability depends upon the methods you use. The further away you get from the transaction, how shall I say it? The fuzzier the results are on here. Um, this is from the latest EMY survey. It comes out every two years on uh, uh, transfer pricing. And this is methods by type. You can see very much here the cup method tends to be used in um, the majority of cases, the exception of services. Most services are priced at cost plus. Notice the profit-based methods are really low. CPM, TNMM, profit splits, you know, not a common method that's used, at least in terms of EMY's customers. So as I said, there are over 50 countries today that have these rules on the books. Um, they don't just have rules on what the methods are that you can use. They have all kinds of procedures. Um, most importantly, I think, are the contemporaneous documentation procedures that have come in. Uh, in that, um, that means if you don't file every year documentation for your transfer pricing policies, if you have um, uh, the revenue authority comes after you and say you manipulated the transfer prices, uh, and uh, they can then impose penalties on you for failing to file. So this increase in documentation, in effect, is shifting the burden of proof to the firm. The firm now gives the government and says, this is the transfer price I used. It does meet the best method test. Here are all the things I have done to do this. And I think most interestingly, you can see who signed on here in 2008. China signed on. And Russia has now announced that in 2010, it will also have contemporaneous documentation requirements as well. <coughs> 
So moving on, why do firms engage in transfer price manipulation? Well, um, as I said, I'm now in a business school. I teach about the theory of the multinational enterprise, and we talk about the benefits that come from multinationality, internalization, benefits that come from being a group and acting across countries. And these are primarily integration economies and arbitrage economies. And transfer pricing is a form of arbitrage. It's taking advantage of differences across countries in ways that can be used to help improve the bottom line for the firm. And in fact, the two related parties collude. And in that, conclusion, that collusion, they then can improve their returns. Let me give you some examples. Uh, we've talked already about these, so I won't spend much time. Corporate income taxes, over-invoicing inbound transfers, under-invoicing outbound transfers is a way to shift profits out of high tax countries. Manipulation of withholding tax rates by shifting buckets so that you put yourself in the lowest rate. Uh, tax holidays, which was just raised in the last uh, question. And, you, and manipulating in places where there is no clear arm's length price. So for example, in this situation, you've got two countries, two rates, you manipulate the prices in and out. Another one that's come up, and again, the political economy paper that just made the last point, this is exactly what this is about in our speaker at lunch. If you have a highly corrupt uh, uh, a country, uh, it would be most likely that any firm that's in there is going to try to get their funds out, and transfer price manipulation is one way to do that. So fear of asset expropriation, high political risk, civil war, uh, forced joint venture partners, uh, corrupt firms that pay and uh, that demand large bribes, firms will say to themselves, why do I want to pay tax to a country like this? I need to move my, I need to move my, my funds out. Trade mispricing, again, uh, ad valorem taxes, and this is both customs duties and on export taxes. Rules of origin tests, for example, in autos and, and under NAFTA can be manipulated by through transfer price manipulation. Foreign exchange, uh, trade balancing requirements. Uh, and the list goes on and on of all the ways that firms can actually the incentives to engage in transfer price manipulation in terms of over or under invoicing. Now, some of the papers that are going to be here, and we've had some talk about this already, about trade mispricing. Uh, the Pack and Zidanowitz, for example, work in this area, uses the interquartile range, anything over 75%, anything under 25%, gives you your estimates of mispricing. Problem with this, of course, is unless it's done at the transaction level and you've control for whether this, these are related parties, so you know this is trade within a multinational as compared to trade within unrelated firms, you've control for the characteristics of the product, the type of the transaction, the type of the firm in the market, as you know from where I started with, you cannot say that this is transfer price manipulation. You get a number, but that number far exceeds what would likely be the number. Uh, in other words, the quality of the data going in is the only way to tell you the quality of the results coming out on here. Let me talk to you a little bit about three areas of transfer pricing involving uh, developing countries. One, natural resources with high political risk, and Nigeria would be an obvious one to talk about in that sense. A second is the call center industry, which we know has become very globalized over the last few years, heavily involved in places like India, for example, and the Philippines, Indonesia, along with Canada. Uh, and then third, uh, just the issue of location savings of when a firm closes up shop here and goes somewhere else where costs are lower. Let me start with the whole idea of extraction of natural resources in a high-risk country. We know from the literature on bribes that uh, firms will walk if the demand for bribery gets too high. And so in effect, then, you can think about tax demands from a, an illegitimate host country as um, add the firm's response to that is making a serious calculation of at what point do I pay the tax versus what point do I walk or do I use transfer price manipulation to get out of, of paying the tax. Here's an example on the call center industry. The issue becomes one of the continuum price problem. There's going to be a gap between if you use cost plus to pay the call center that's located in the Philippines, shall we say, and then the downstream firm that owns this uh, that is making the, uh, the money on the marketing and the manufacturing intangibles coming out of here. To whom do you allocate that return that's in the middle? Number three, 
uh, location savings. When we shift offshore, when I closed down a firm in New York and I shifted to a Maquiladora in Juarez, what happens? Uh, who gets the return from having moved off to a country with lower costs? Uh, again, each of these three cases are legitimate cases for the firm trying to decide what a transfer pricing policy is in the context where there are arbitrage opportunities that face the firm. Question is, is this illegal? Well, first let me start by saying uh, I think transfer pricing for the firm is a balancing act. There are internal motivations for setting transfer pricing as well as external. Everything we know from the work that's been done and looking inside multinationals tell us that firms, the important for them is competitiveness and their allocation of resources. Prices are a signal that allocate resources inside the firm. They motivate the managers and they reward performance. In other words, there are internal motivations for setting these prices that cannot be ignored. If you set prices simply on the basis to reduce tax, you're going to cause misallocation resources on the inside. What happens then is firms actually have to try to look at both sets of motivations. Typically about three quarters of firms set their transfer pricing policies at head office. They don't allocate them out to the subsidiaries, they do it at head office. And the reason why they centralize those decisions is because they are aware of these complexity of the demands. I think of Tinberg and right, and all the goals you have want to achieve, the number of, a number of policy tools you need to achieve these. Uh, related to this, then, is the issue of whether firms can simply set multiple sets of books. And I think if we went back to the 80s, my perception is they clearly did. There was one set of books that was motivating managers inside, and then there was a separate set of books that were filed for tax authorities. One of the things that has ended that is contemporaneous documentation. Contemporaneous documentation says to the firm, file these transfer prices, these methods with the tax authorities, and you need to use them. So you're using one set of books now that has to have be based on these complicated measures. Um, some stuff in here about how important firms see as transfer pricing. Um, firms, the number of firms expecting an audit, the increase in penalties, sectors like pharmaceuticals that are particularly sensitive. Let me move on to the, the ethical issues here. Um, I've talked about this in sort of three ways. Some of it we've talked about before, just legal definitions of what is tax planning, what is tax avoidance, and I'll reference Learned Hand here, which most of you know the quote, when none of us owes tax more than the law requires us to pay. Tax evasion, which is the use of uh, loopholes or your interpretation of the tax law, uh, problems with abusive or sham transactions. And even if it's evasion, doesn't necessarily mean there's going to be penalties attached. To that, you need to actually move to fraud. Fraud is tax evasion with a deliberate lie so as to hide information or mislead information. Uh, against the tax authority. But if I put this on a line, and let me call it uh, green, uh, orange, and red, how do I know when a transaction takes place whether it's green, it's legal, whether it's orange, it's maybe illegal, but uh, it's still within the tax law, or it's moved all the way over to red, and that it actually is tax fraud. The bright line test, I think, is very difficult to tell, and we don't make it any easier. Uh, in terms of not being more specific in the rules. Uh, the paper then goes on to talk about tax ethics versus moral ethics. Um, there are only four or five papers written on the ethics of transfer pricing, and to be honest, I don't think any of them are very good. Uh, and we, need, we do need more work in, in this area. If we are going to try to convince tax planning Tax planners, in other words, the big four, you're going to convince the big four that when they're giving advice to multinationals on how to cut tax, that they are somehow behaving unethically, you have to somehow move them from thinking from a tax ethics, a situational perspective, that what they do is legal, not only legal, but it is also moral. It is the focus of the tax planning community to tell their clients how to save on tax. That's what they do. That's what they're paid for. And the more creative they are, the better they are paid. Right? That's the way the industry thinks and the way it works. If you're going to move to thinking about uh, transfer price manipulation is immoral, somehow you have to get across the idea, not just to the tax planning community, but to the firms, that they need to go, how shall I say it, above and beyond. 
they need to pay above and beyond what is necessary uh, to comply with the tax code. To me, that looks quite a lot like the CSR literature. Uh, I work a little bit on corporate social responsibility. How do you get firms to engage in CSR acts? Uh, they focus not just on shareholders, they shift to a focus on stakeholders. And so pay, maybe part of what we have to do here is think about a move over to stakeholders. Let me end here by talking about some policy options. Uh, I started out by talking about actually getting rid of tax deferral. Um, my own sort of perception is if we were to get rid of tax deferral, tax deferral for a, a home country sets an umbrella over everybody else's rates, such that if you have a low rate then, or you have a high rate, it doesn't matter. The overall rate is across the top, and that eliminates the incentive for transfer price manipulation. I then go on to talk about subpart F and check the box in the U.S., and you know one of Obama's proposals is to get rid of check the box. I heard at the fraud conference that uh, the tax planning community's already figured out a way to get around getting rid of check the box. So <laughs> um, we're always one step ahead. Uh, and then I go on to talk about the role of the OECD and the, and the Committee on Fiscal Affairs, which I think has played an extraordinarily important role in this. And I go on to suggest some ways that we could strengthen the OECD's role here, through a greater increase in bilateral and trilateral APAs, binding arbitration, actually using it, more transparency. I would actually suggest not just straight automatic exchange of information, but maybe automatic exchange of the contemporaneous documentation, which is now being filed with multiple countries, and a really expanded move to try and get developing countries into the tax treaty network, where they are not there now. And then at zero, one last minute, um, I go on to talk about hypernorms and the UN Global Contact, the um, Wolfsburg Group Trade Finance Principles, and then SOX Fin 48. And in particular, the one I want to show you, here's the UN Global Contact hypernorms. Here's my proposal. We take the last one on anti-corruption and we add this sentence. Not only should businesses work against corruption in all of its forms, including extortion and bribery, but they should refrain from corrupt business practices, including tax evasion, fraud, and abusive transfer pricing. And uh, I'll end up by saying the fraud triangle on motivation, opportunity, and capability could be used as a way to start to think about this. Motivation, opportunity, and capability lead to action. Action leads to effects. The first paper we heard this morning was on the impacts, the effects. I actually think where it should be placed is on the actions. But we could, I think, move from the fraud triangle here to see, to actually develop a theory of uh, abusive transfer pricing. And so I'll conclude by saying, uh, I think transfer pricing is a critically important role for the firm. Transfer pricing manipulation is driven by arbitrage. You want to get rid of it, you got to get rid of arbitrage. Not all transfer pricing manipulation is illegal or immoral. We've got to actually work on the arbitrage opportunities. Um, I look forward to your questions. Thank you very much.